We're about to begin. We were just saying that maybe this is a time that people start nodding off, but I'd suggest not nodding off because I think this is going to be a fascinating uh, discussion with our guests. And it's really, um, I, I, I think of it in terms of, you know, we've talked a lot of, about big ideas and how things um, are happening and, and will happen with NATO. Um, and yet, here's at least one person who is literally on the front lines in the sense of the reality of, what, of how NATO will react, how Russia will react, plays out um, in Estonia and in the Baltics in general. So I think it'll be a, a fascinating uh, conversation. I'm Jill Doherty. Um, I was in television for a long time, so my attention span is very short. And I like to keep things, keep things moving and try to keep myself going for the main points. So I'll try to, to do that. And I think you, but you, again, as has been said, you know our guests, and I won't uh, get into all of the details, but certainly um, from the end there, Ambassador Yuri Luik, Ambassador of Estonia to Russia, and a very long um, history in many different positions. I was really struck by how many jobs you've had in the government for Estonia. And then we have uh, Robert Kaplan, who is the chief geopolitical strategist for Stratfor and many other things as well. And what we t decided to do here was kind of um, turn this into a brainstorming session. And uh, essentially, we'll be talking about, let's call it the neighborhood, which would be Ambassador Luik's uh, bailiwick here. And then Robert would also get into Europe, but he would go uh, farther afield into the Middle East and Asia. And of course, we can mix it up as we go along, but that's kind of how we would divide it. And I was just thinking, as I've been here since this morning, and really taking in uh, everything. And I'm struck by the fact that although this discussion about the future of NATO, what NATO's role is, obviously has been going on for quite a while and the report is there to read. But I think if you, if you think of the most um, recent trigger, it's Ukraine, which is not a member of NATO. And a crisis sparked in Ukraine, which really wasn't directly of NATO's making. I mean, it was more of an EU decision or, you know, uh, let's say, action that began to set this in train. So that started me thinking that we have a lot of these, uh, this strategic unpredictability, things coming out of left field that you might not think about, both in terms of sparking this crisis and then how this crisis is going to play out literally around the world, which it is. And we can see that as far afield as Asia. So um, I would like to uh, begin with this. We're going to have some opening remarks from both gentlemen. But really, the, the overall question is, what is the next crisis? And is NATO equipped to deal with it? So, um, uh, Robert, actually, Ambassador Luik, why don't we start with you, if that's OK? You start five minutes or so on what, what is on your mind as, as you sit there thinking about the next crisis. Thank you, Jill. And uh, thank you to the Atlantic Council for inviting me. Uh, I would have to make a small qualification. I'm a sitting ambassador in Moscow, so I, I hope you understand when I emphasize that these are all my personal views and not the views of the <laughs> Estonian government, necessarily. Uh, let me start by saying that, looking from Estonia, uh, it is clear that uh, President Putin's actions in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, the uh, aggression in East Ukraine, it has profound implications to European security order and uh, profound implications to the world security order. I would call Putin a revolutionary leader, a revolutionary leader of magnitude, somebody who has actually managed in a short time span to change fundamentally the premises of what has been developed over tens and tens of years, both during the Cold War and post-Cold War. Uh, Unfortunately, because I'm in Russia, and uh, I know many, many Russians, it's, it, it's a great country, 
But uh, I have to say that uh, reinsurgent Russia has become a serious risk factor in European security. And we can ignore that only in our own peril. Uh, and since uh, this risk analysis is of paramount importance, and if we apply the classical rule of how strategic risks are assessed, you have capability and you have intent. And capabilities are there to create trouble and possibly havoc, at least in the near neighborhood. And the intent is clearly expressed. I mean, you start from the Munich speech, you start with uh, the Georgian aggression, and obviously you end with Ukraine. Uh, perhaps you don't end with Ukraine, but the Ukraine, the contemporary crisis in Ukraine. And I think the speech of Putin of 18th of March, when he expressed his worldview, actually, in a very comprehensive manner, uh, when the annexation of Crimea was celebrated in, in, in the Kremlin. Uh, it's a unique speech, because uh, it provides a worldview of a leader who today is, I would say, an absolute leader of his huge country, which spans over nine time zones and has thousands of nuclear weapons. So it's something uh, certainly to be looked at. Uh, so when it comes to strategy, the intent is clear. But when it comes to tactics, then talking to many, many people in Moscow, it is clear that the tactical decisions in Moscow are not staffed through. I mean, they are very much the decisions of one man. That's why it is extremely difficult to predict what the next moves will be. The decision-making process is very fluid. It's very ad hoc. And although several scenarios have been prepared, including, I believe, the Crimea scenario, and the preparation started actually when President Yushchenko said that the Russian Black Sea Fleet should leave in 2017. Uh, but when to use this scenario and how to use this scenario, this is very much an ad hoc decision, essentially an ad hoc decision of one man. Uh, I would clearly, uh, I, I, I would point out some of the major issues which I think we should keep in mind when looking at the threats, some of the major trends in Moscow. And then I will mention a couple of geographical points, which I believe uh, we should also keep in mind. Uh, one is uh, structural economic difficulties, which have now brought Russian economy to recession in this year. Almost all uh, analysts are very <laughs> clear here. And obviously, the huge defense spending, the increasing defense spending, and the huge spending, which is going towards Crimea, are only exasperating the situation. And uh, a lot of this stuff is not in the budget, used with uh, various extra budgetary means. And uh, I have to recall to you that Russia is starting a snap exercise almost weekly. Mm. If you look at the media, almost weekly, there is another snap exercise. And I think all people here in the room who have dealt with that kind of stuff, imagine how expensive it is if you move tens of thousands of people and equipment from one corner of Russia to the other. So there's a lot of spending. Uh, and obviously, the uh, need for mobilization of the Russian society, which uh, due to economic circumstances, it's not so easy to do it by just throwing money towards uh, various consumers, or towards the voters. Uh, you have to mobilize this uh, community by other means. And clearly, the aggressive moves in the neighborhood 
are a way to mobilize uh, Russian citizens. You need to create a feeling of victimhood, which has been, I believe, created. And you have to be creating also a powerful enemy figure. And of course, this powerful enemy figure is the West writ large. Uh, surprisingly so, Russians are not separating uh, Estonia and Great Britain anymore. I mean, they used to play one against the other. But now, when you want to show that the enemy is a huge dark matter, a huge dark power, and you mention Estonia, that doesn't sound credible. So you actually have to slump all the Western countries together. You remember in, in a speech, Putin said uh, that we have been contained for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obvious that Estonia wouldn't have been able to contain Russia for hundreds of years. In fact, very few countries, uh, when thinking of the history, would have been able to do that. So it's the West uh, writ large, and this anti-Western feeling is constantly, constantly uh, encouraged and exasperated, uh, encouraged and, and supported uh, by the Russian regime. Uh, third tendency and third point, uh, power in Russia, as I said, is very, very personal. Uh, there's a small group of people who can influence President Putin. This group is also very fluid. Uh, they don't have clear uh, professions or clear government postings. Uh, there are rumors about who had visited Putin's birthday, for instance, and whether that is important or not. And well, actually, we don't know whether that's important or not. Perhaps somebody went to Putin's birthday and spilled uh, red wine and has become a, a, a kind of a confrontational figure. But anyway, it's known that there is a small, small group of people uh, who can influence and who are at least uh, consulted. Uh, but it is clear that their background is very much in security services, which has led to the, I don't know what the word should be, securitization of the whole society. Security and militarism are the response to all issues, to all questions. And the Russian army has become the symbol of greatness and power of the society, uh, something which is played in the Russian media over and over again. Uh, and one point which I would also mention in response to what has been discussed here is uh, the point about the Russian minority. I mean, it's always said that there are some countries who have Russian minority, my country among them, who are under bigger threat than other neighboring states. I actually don't believe that, because the issue of Russian minorities is used in a very simple and crude way. It's like with a switch. You can put it on. You can put it off. If you listen to Putin's explanation of why Crimea was annexed, then he started with protecting the Russian minority. Then he moved into Crimea has always been ours historically. Then he went into, there are a lot of war memorials in Crimea. And now he has stopped at the argument that in case we haven't had moved in Crimea, NATO would have taken it, and the Black Sea would have been controlled, of the Russian access uh, to Black Sea would have been controlled by NATO. So really, he can pick and choose arguments. And I don't believe we should very much focus on the Russian minority, although this is a good argument, kind of red meat in internal discussions, uh, in, uh, and, and mobilizing the Russian society, something which can be, can be used. And now, let me say a couple of words uh, about the geographical conflict areas, which I see as worth looking at. I'm not saying that there is a new war starting somewhere, but I'm saying these are sort of important areas to look at. First, of course, Ukraine, far from solved, and the uh, conflict, I believe, 
will continue for a very long time. There are various reasons for that. But it is also clear that Ukraine has become the new Germany. I mean, it is the country, the big price, the big uh, field where East and West is sort of are, are fighting, out, uh, fighting it out, uh, in mainly in covert means, but also in means of values, et cetera, et cetera. So Ukraine will be, is, and will be uh, the, key, uh, the key issue for a long way to come. And Putin knows that. And there's no intention, uh, I'm sure, in Putin's mind to, to, to give it up or to be content with a kind of very, very weak, uh, weak uh, solution. Uh, I would be very much looking at Kazakhstan and Belarus. Mm -hmm. Both of these countries are in the Russian sphere of influence uh, due to the decision of the leadership. I mean, Kazakhstan less, because Kazakhstan has a number of national interests uh, which are dependent on their desire to balance China and Russia. So any Kazakh leader will, will probably be at least fairly pro-Russian or, or, or working actively with Russia. And of course, Kazakhstan is very, very vulnerable. I mean, the north of Kazakhstan uh, is, it is difficult to, to protect that. There's no, no doubt about it. Uh, with Belarus, there's a different dynamic. I mean, Belarus can easily leave the sphere of influence when there will be a change of government. Uh, so there is another big price, another country which might be lost. And I'm sure this would be a, a big problem. Uh, then there is Moldova. I understand you, you, you will touch about Moldova, Georgia. I won't go deeply into that. We can do it later. And in the end, I would say a couple of words about the NATO frontline states, something which has been discussed here thoroughly. And my own country has been used as a, uh, as a major example here. I am constantly surprised by people using the argument that because our Eastern allies are worried, we should do something. If it would only be our psychological disposition that we are sort of inadequately worried, nobody would do anything. I mean, people who do make decisions today to place limited amounts of troops to the Baltic states are worried because their own country might be drawn into a conflict. And they want to avoid this decision by any means possible. And if it takes bringing 300 paratroopers to Estonia, that's a very small price to pay. And I'm sure even a higher price to pay is a very small price to pay to deter a possible aggression. And talking to people all around the defense community, of people who actually work with these issues in defense department, there is an overwhelming concern. This is not something which comes from our sick mind. It is there. Uh, and the other issue which we are very much concerned of is, uh, uh, you know, it has been mentioned many times here that there is a new war now, kind of a hybrid thing. And I'm very happy that, uh, uh, that this was, uh, to some extent, uh, explained by the uh, Fabrice, by, by the NATO representative. Uh, this is not a new type of war. There are aspects to it which are new and creative. But the main threat is the Russian army on the other side of the border. I mean, that is the main threat. Other aspects of this hybrid warfare can be handled. Some of them can be handled by a nation state. Some of them can be handled by the European Union, for instance. And I would say we needn't even worry about it in this kind of large defense community. Uh, if 20 green men prop up somewhere, we can take care of them. If 200 prop up, even if 500 prop up, we can really take care of them. The question is, 
if this is combined with the presence of huge Russian contingent on the other side of the border. I mean, that's the, and it's a very classic scenario. It's not a new scenario. It's a very classic scenario. So NATO should be very clear uh, and should provide protection uh, for the allies via showing credible defense, via showing readiness to act. The tripwire, again, a very old trick in the book, is the best way of doing it. And I'm very happy that, that people are doing it. So I will end with that. OK. Thank you. And um, Robert, you just came back from Moldova and also from Romania. So maybe you want to start us out uh, there. Why don't I start off with <clears throat> Romania and Moldova and then migrate across Eurasia, ending up with uh, the Korean Peninsula. Um, and I'll try to be quick about it. Um, Romania and Moldova, the southeastern front there, are uh, somewhat protected by the Carpathian Mountains. They're not, it's not the North European plain that so exposes the Baltic states and Poland to Russian aggression. So maybe it's more subtle there. But I was a reporter there for a month. And here's what P prime ministers, presidents, national security advisors told me. They said Article 5 protects against the Red Army or you know, conventional invasion, a you know, a red line, a you know, trip wire, whatever it is. Article 5 is not what we're worried about. You know, Article 5 doesn't really matter to us. What we're, nothing in NATO protects us against Russian subversion, Russian, Russia running criminal networks, Russia buying up banks and infrastructure, Russia using third parties to buy media that then influence public opinion. Russia loves weak, weakly institutionalized corrupt democracies because there's more politicians to bribe. Give them a weak democracy and they love it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, Russia, uh, and, and, ver and then I, I was also told that in the 21st century, Gazprom is a greater threat to freedom than the Red Army. Um, and uh, that, you know, if you look at the web work of pipelines, and this is what two countries have not gotten into the news in the past few months, which shows that you can weaken and infiltrate a country from within without consequences, without making the other side nervous. Um, you know, I was constantly told that Putin is not an apparatchik, he's an intelligence officer. Um, he wants to, it's all about taking over or influencing countries from within, because the old form of Russian empire, the Warsaw Pact, didn't work. It broke down. It was too expensive for the Soviet Union. Putin's, uh, if Putin's smart. He knows this. He's looking for a more traditional form of imperialism, a more subtle traditional form of imperialism like Finlandization or something. The two countries are Bulgaria and Hungary. Um, Hungary's prime minister, Viktor Orban, may be the most interesting prime minister in Europe that the West doesn't write anything about. Because he's essentially very right wing. Some have called him neo authoritarian. He, you know, he's, you know, his government has just moved to control banks, control media. Every action he takes seems to show that he's just as worried or interested in what Moscow thinks as what the EU thinks. He's like an EU country that's migrated towards a neutralism between uh, the EU and Russia, and yet nobody writes about it. Um, Bulgaria. Bulgaria gets 90% of its natural gas from, from Russia. Uh, Bulgaria is infiltrated by crime groups. Bulgaria has worked in the past to make sure that Nabucco, uh, Azerbaijani oil, doesn't make it into Europe, but that Russian oil through South Stream does. Uh, so uh, Bulgaria is a country in the EU, in NATO, that's migrating towards a neutralism as well uh, uh, between Russia and NATO. Um, uh, so this, I was told, this is the future. Uh, you know, you know this, is the, this is how you influence and, and distort countries from within without causing a crisis that leads to sanctions and other things like that. Because the whole notion of a red line gets completely erased. It becomes more subtle than that. All right, Moldova. Moldova has been called a borderland. It's more than that. It's got many little borderlands within the borderland. It's got ethnic Ukrainians who, by the way, are pro-Russian, ethnic Russians who are pro-Russian, 
ethnic Bulgarians who are pro-Russian, and ethnic Turkic Christian Gagauz in the south who are super pro-Russian and control territory and want to uh, federalize and partially secede from Moldova. Um, and then you have the ethnic, the dominant ethnic Romanian community, which is split between ethnic Romanians who are pro-Russian and anti-Russian. And there are towns that I visited in Moldova where the population is split between pro and anti. The Gagauz want to split away. I was constantly told, see this town Baltz? This is the next Donetsk. Um, um, you, know, uh, you know, this is because it's a weakly institutionalized, fragile, super corrupt state with minority groups that are sympathetic to Russia. And when you're in Moldova, Russia's real, whereas the West is just an interesting geopolitical concept. Um, and uh, so this, this could be a mean, you know, watch Moldova. It has a future in the headlines. Um, other places, I think, that have futures in the headlines moving, moving away from, the, uh, from Europe, but I'm going to end up with Russia, is, all right, the Middle East. Uh, Syria no longer exists. Iraq no longer exists. Libya no longer exists. The capital of Tripoli is just the is not the capital of a country anymore. It's the central dispatch point for negotiations amongst tribes, gangs, and militias. Um, it, you know, it, it, Libya was just eviscerated by the uh, uh, by the Western uh, air. Uh, air action. It melted away, and Libya's instability, or former Libya's instability, is causing significant problems on the borders with Tunisia and Algeria. Algeria may, may be the next big country in the, Ar in the Middle East to experience real high levels of unrest. Its leader, uh, Abdelaziz Bouteflika, is dying or near death. He's the only one who is able to hold the various security services, military, and political establishment all in one piece um, together. Um, it's, a, it's a vast, dispersed country. The southern Sahara region is really not so much part of Algeria, but par a part of the Sahara that's occupied by the Algerian army. Um, so I would watch Algeria in terms of future or next crisis. I would watch Saudi Arabia with an emphasis on Asir province in the southwest because Yemen, uh, uh, you know, y Yemen is the demographic hub of, of the Arabian Peninsula. It's got only a fourth of the land area of Saudi Arabia, but almost as many people. Um, and it's, it's Yemen, like Libya, like Iraq, like Syria, no longer exists, essentially. Um, you know, this has been the result, the real result of the Arab Spring, which has not been about democracy. It's, about the, it's been about the collapse of central authority. And, in, and, and Asir province is right next to the unstable, un, totally unpoliced border with Yemen, full of gun running, um, it, you know, heavy tribal, uh, you know, militarized elements. Uh, Saudi Arabia has 40% male youth unemployment, a diminishing water table, um, a royal family that's gone from rule by about seven or ten into, you know, into debt, you know, gradual uh, um, actuarial death into, into rules by vast hordes of grandchildren of the royal family, which means more factionalization and harder and harder to rule from the center. If you were to ask me, there's only one real country in the, in the, in the, in the Muslim world in the Middle East. Uh, of course, Turkey. Now, now, Iran. Iran is a real country. Turkey is a real country. These other places are not real countries. Um, and that's why I think the very fact that Iran will hold together as a state, whatever happens to it, will make it, um, in a relative term, stronger and stronger. Watch the Fergana Valley in Central Asia. That is the demographic hub of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. The reason, those, the reason Uzbekistan is the most populous country in, in, in Central Asia is simply because most of the Fergana Valley happens to be in Uzbekistan. If they change the border by just a few miles inside the Fergana Valley, Uzbekistan would lose, lose a large amount of population. Now, you have large numbers of Tajiks in Uzbekistan, large numbers of Uzbeks in Tajikistan. Uh, it is a very fragile area with rising Islamic fundamentalism, increased leadership that's about to, you know, to transition because of age. 
um, banking crisis in Kazakhstan, continuing unrest in Kyrgyzstan. And so I, Central Asia has is still run in some countries by the same uh, Brezhnev era central committee man types as in the past. And these people will be passing from the scene. And what's interesting about Central Asia, it never had a post-Soviet crisis, with the exception of the Tajik Civil War in the 1990s. So it's, it's you know, the Baltic states had their peaceful revolution. Uh, the, uh, George, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia fell into war over Nagorno-Karabakh, but Central Asia has stayed more or less relatively stable under, under a Soviet-style system. And that, uh, that may now be coming apart. Um, uh, in, in the Far East, um, we thought that capitalism would lead to um, universal values. In decades of successful capitalism in the Far East has led to a military arms race. Um, a military arms race of submarines, fighter jets, uh, um, amphibious warships, cy uh, uh, cy cyber warfare, it's uh, ballistic missiles. It's a very high-end arms race. And what's at issue is not ideas like you read about on the op-ed pages. It's simply about territory and ethnicity. It's, you know, it's the Japanese and the Chinese fighting about islands in the East China Sea. The Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Malaysians, the Filipinos arguing about the, the South China Sea, who owns what space in the blue water water territory. Um, the, the military arms race over the past few decades is real. The, the disputes are real. Um, it's not just about rocks. It's about national prestige. It's about possible energy fines. It's about China trying to do to the South China Sea and East China Sea what the United States did to the greater Caribbean in the 19th and early 20th century. Use it as a way to gain an outlet to the wider world through dominance. Um, in China's case, to the Indian Ocean. In America's case, it was to gain dominance of the, West, of the Western Hemisphere and the greater Caribbean. Um, so this is n the, the, um, the East Asia is not just a place for people to wear business suits and fly business class to do deals. It's becoming a real military theater of action, uh, though on a much more high-end, elegant way than the Middle East or Eastern Ukraine. Finally, Russia and China in terms of uh, future crises. There's a kind of easy acceptance, I find, in the West that the future of, if only Putin would go and only the Communist Party would go, we would have democracy, stable democracy in Russia, and we would have stable democracy in China. I think it is precisely authoritarianism that is holding these places together. Um, that, um, is, a, a, as Ambassador Lewick said, it's a very personalized system in Russia. Uh, it's, not, it, it's not staffed through, which means it's not institutionalized. And if it's, and if it's, an, uh, if it's a super uber energy state, and the energy is going to diminish in the years and decades ahead, and institutions have not been built, the future of Russia may be semi-chaotic uh, in that sense. Um, what chi and finally, China. China has Inner Mongolians in the north, Turkic Uyghur Muslims in the west, Tibetans in the southwest, all of whom have terrible relations with the dominant ethnic Han Chinese. Um, and what, the, what the, uh, the ruling party is, is afraid of, rightly so, is that any form of politicalization will lead to a, a sustained rise in ethnic turbulence uh, that would threaten China itself. So um, the, I, I think what's holding stability together in Eurasia is precisely what we don't want, which is authoritarianism. I, I think beyond authoritarianism is not necessarily democracy. Thank you. Mm, wow. Well, Robert, you've succeeded in making me even more nervous than I was at 9 o'clock this morning. So let's, I, there's a lot there. But I, I want to start very specifically with Ambassador, Ambassador Luik. Um, d when you look at threats, you mentioned you know troops and uh, troops on the border. Th let's make it very basic. Do you believe that Vladimir Putin is intent, or perhaps might, on the spur of the moment, decide to use military force in the Baltics, specifically in Estonia? 
when the answer is, I don't know. But uh, if you ask me whether I can exclude that, then it's clear I cannot. And I don't think anybody can. I would say, and I've been dealing with this stuff for a long time, that uh, I would have put the likelihood for a long time at, I don't know, 2 3%, perhaps not more. Now I would put it somewhere in kind of 40%. Mm. So if it's 40%, yep. do you trust, well, sorry, if you want to continue, but do you trust that NATO would come to your defense? Well, that, that's what I was getting about. Uh, I think it very much depends on what we are doing. I mean, the percentage very much depends on whether we are serious about the tripwire, whether we are serious about the political will, whether we are serious about honestly analyzing Russia. So the percentage actually can go up or down depending on what we do. So it's not all about what Putin would do. But I think we have to understand, if you look at what Putin has said lately, then one of his basic ideas is that countries have to earn sovereignty. That sovereignty is not something which is, quote unquote, given by the international law. It's basically a power game. So if the alliance, and the alliance is of course not a state, but let's say, an alliance as an organization wants to maintain its sovereignty of decision making, then it has to be forceful and it has to be powerful. And I very much agree with the point which was made here. It's not so much, it's not so important how many troops you have. It's more important whether you are ready to use them. And uh, how quickly, how decisively, how much are you willing to risk, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, that's the big strength mm -hmm. of uh, President, uh, President Putin. But I don't think that the Baltic states would be the first target to come. Hmm. Robert, you know, when you look at the world that you've described, um, it's very chaotic, it's very unpredictable. Um, it is rife with states that are falling apart or uh, never have been cohesive to begin with. You know, NATO, how does NATO deal with a world like this in which you can't really predict what's going to happen? They're not traditional, um, let's say, threats to, to NATO per se. And yet you're saying that these are potential red flags or potential conflicts. So how does NATO, is NATO even equipped to begin to deal with some, a world like that? Uh, I don't think it is. Because I think you put your money where your mouth is. You put your money in your defense budgets, uh, which are not just about tanks and planes, but about intelligence services, special operations forces, all of which must be deployable. Um, I think that NATO is coming off a war in Afghanistan, a decade-long war that many would argue that it lost or had a draw about, and that most of uh, the overwhelming amount of the fighting and hard work was done by the Americans with one or two other countries, where some of the countries just were there to staff an office in Kabul in order to claim that they took part, but in fact did very little or nothing. Um, I think that, um, remember why NATO was founded. It was founded to stop the Red Army. It was founded while Stalin was still alive. Um, when the Red Army was encamped in eastern Germany uh, and, and literally from, the, from Pilsudski's Baltic to the Black Seas, his Intimarium, was, was, was occupied by the Red Army. And so NATO had a specific purpose, defend Western Europe. Uh, America would come to the defense. And America was the central organizing principle. And because the World War II was so close in the past, and so many GIs had served in Europe, it was easy to make the argument to the American public that Europe mattered, that we had to defend it. Um, you know, all this was real to the average common man. But now where 
many decades, 70 years from World War II, whole new generations. You have generations of European politicians in Western Europe who grew up thinking it was all about social welfare budgets because after all the Americans were providing the security. And, have, um, and so you have anemic defense budgets in many European countries. And you have an American public for whom very few people are still alive from World War II who say, why do we have to defend Europe if they're not paying for it themselves? So um, I, I, don't, I, I think it would take really strong presidential geopolitical leadership with a real message a re, uh, uh, um, to really reinvigorate uh, uh, NATO. Uh, for instance, I was thinking, what would Ronald Reagan have done atmospherically after, the, after Crimea was annexed? President Obama went to Brussels and made a speech where he looked like he was reading from his lines. Uh, um, Reagan would have gone to Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia, or one place near the Russian border in the Baltics, and said, Mr. Putin, I want you to know I am standing on hallowed NATO ground. I mean, you know, it would have been, it, you know, it would have been of, of that order. And it would take a leadership of that determined magnitude, I think, to rescue NATO at this point. Um, you know, you've been referring to the, uh, to the Russian army as the Red Army. <laughs> Yeah, oh, um, excuse me. Which would Why am be, I well, doing this? It yeah. may be yeah. significant. I mean, Freudian are, slip. Yeah. In, yeah. in all of this, are, are yeah. we back to that confrontation? Are we uh, back to um, you know, Russia as kind of the Soviet Union? Or? Well, if you think about it, um, czarist imperialism never died, really. Uh, uh, Lenin sort of co-opted czarist imperialism. Uh, you know, that's what the reconquest of, the, of Transcaucasia and Central Asia were about, it, you, know, after, you know, at the tail end of the Russian Civil War uh, in the 1920s. Then, after the Soviet Union collapsed, you had almost a decade of Boris Yeltsin's incompetent, chaotic rule, where Russia was not a threat. And, and, uh, but now you have kind of a rediscovery of the old imperial tradition, I would say. Whether you call it czarist or Soviet or czarist come Soviet, I, I don't know. But it's an imperial tradition that goes back many hundreds of years. Um, Ambassador, you know, you know this region very well. You know Russia very well. So um, in a way, it's counterintuitive what Putin is doing. Because if he wants to have a relationship with Europe, if he wants to be integrated, and this is a question mark, do, you know, does he? But let's say that he does. Then why is he doing this? Why is he pushing it, pushing the envelope to what some previous uh, panelists have described as, as uh, dangerous levels? Yeah, I'm on a very dangerous ground now. Uh, that's the ambassador to Moscow. But, uh, we can put you as informed sources or something yeah, like that. Informed sources. Uh, informed sources believe that uh, <laughs> President Putin and, and the Russian government uh, have decided that one way of realizing the full potential of Russia is to build a strong, large, powerful country. Some of the assumptions that the country should be, you know, innovative and modern and flexible, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, do not count for these guys. For them, the strengths are military, security, the vastness of the territory. That is what counts. So the assumption of what is good for Russia and what should a Russian leader, any Russian leader, do are simply very different. That's why it's difficult for us to say. I mean, we can say that, looking from our point of view, he doesn't seem to be doing any good for, for, for Russian people. But that's not the assumptions there. How should NATO deal with the challenges that Putin is presenting that stop short of Chapter 5? Th things that, that are destabilizing but aren't overtly military. What, what do you think, Robert? Um, well, I think 
like any military organization, it can only survive and remain relevant if it innovates. Um, it, it, it innova and remember, modern industrialized mass infantry warfare, which was really codified by Napoleon, but which has existed since the, you know, take your pick, in mid 18th century up until the mid 20th century, is over the large span of history unusual. Uh, in, to some extent. Um, that's, why the, that's why the whole literature of insurgency and counterinsurgency, I believe, will never go out of fashion. They'll all be classics, because insurgency and counterinsurgency go back to Greek antiquity. Uh, and they continued up into our era. So if they've lasted this long, uh, co coined nistas, whatever you want to call them, are going to remain relevant. Now, and so I, I, I think NATO needs a very uh, insurgent, counterinsurgent, uh, innovative approach to how to deal with Russia's concept of what I'll call total war. Everything from buying off politicians and weak democracies at one end of the spectrum to the Russian army at the other end of the spectrum, with somewhere in the middle of the spectrum um, uh, people with ski masks and, um, and, and assault rifles who claim that they're just independent humanistic citizens, you know, you know taking, up their, uh, taking up their rights. And in other words, there's so much pl plausible deniability in eastern Ukraine by Russia that it's almost implausible deniability. Um, and, it's, um, and so uh, Russia is going to come at it from many ways. And unless NATO could figure out how to have a whole of government, whole of warfare approach from intelligence, anti-crime, anti-corruption, unless all that can fit within a NATO umbrella, NATO is either going to become a very limited uh, a very limited use, uh, I, I would say, will, will, be, you know, will, be less and less, uh, will be less and less relevant. Mm. Ambassador, do, what do you think about forward basing in your neighborhood for NATO? I, I very much support that, uh, <laughs> clearly. But, but to what extent? What are, what are you talking about? Well, obviously, looking from our point of view, we, we are ready for anything the Alliance is ready to throw at us. <laughs> but quite realistically, of course, uh, the options which were described here uh, regarding the rotation, but permanent rotation of troops, meaning that there is always a presence. Uh, presence today is quite small, uh, and uh, it is clearly a tripwire effect. Uh, there's no doubt that the principle of tripwire will remain, whether the size will be bigger or smaller, the principle will remain. Uh, we believe that there should be units uh, which would have let's say, heavier equipment at their, proposal, uh, at their disposal, simply to make a point. I mean, the, the, uh, the paratrooper units today are very lightly, very, very lightly armed. Uh, and uh, I think politically, I, again, it wouldn't have any military, much military relevance, but I think politically uh, sort of heavier presence would, would make a stronger point. Uh, and uh, pre-positioning of material, I believe, has uh, a great future in, in, in creating a, a forward positioning capability. Uh, as was mentioned here, there is a lot of surplus equipment, and uh, it can easily be pre-positioned. Of, of course, the, the key is that it should be usable. I mean, it, it cannot be scrap metal. It should be usable equipment. But I don't think there is a lack of equipment uh, in terms of NATO, uh, NATO capabilities. So I very much believe that uh, prepositioning pre of material is reasonable, and I'm also sure it will come. So, mm -hmm. so these two components, I think, are okay. important. Uh, I'd love to get some questions. Uh, is there anybody? Um, I see a gentleman right here. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Arwan Nagadek from George Washington. Um, what's interesting is it, some of this story starts with Kosovo, doesn't it? I mean, with the, you find the Russians rejecting the, uh, the independence of Kosovo because they know that, that 
process can kill them uh, of uh, the rec recognition of uh, of ethnic minorities and the and the responsibility to to protect so you get the russians initially say you can't be you can't do that in, in kosovo be because this can kill us uh, and then give it a few years and the russians are saying we can do what we are doing in crimea because you you did it in, in kosovo mm. even though that sort of process can can still kill us um so in that sense we we talked about how nato could learn from what's going on, would learn from what's going on in Crimea, um, you know, in a defensive sense. But, but isn't, don't you feel that Russia just gave us the, 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 the how-to guide uh, offensively to how do you, how do you mess with Russia? Uh, you uh, utilize some of the techniques that they applied in Crimea. Um, and where, especially going to uh, Dr. Kaplan here, the, where would the main fault lines be in that sense? You know, we've been talking about, is Dagestan the place where Russia can be hurt? Or, or, or how do you see it? The second is... Um, um, let's, it, let's keep it focused, okay? I think that might sure. be okay. enough yeah. for, uh, for all one. Right. Robert? First of all, one thing about the, uh, the successful U.S.-led interventions in the Balkans in 95 and 99 that never gets enough attention is that the only reason they were able to happen was because Russia was weak at the time. Because this was a normal traditional sphere of Russian influence going back into the 19th century and earlier. And Yeltsin was simply unable to stop it. Or, and in other words, they didn't even have to consider Russia's answer in this. They could just do what they wanted if they felt it was necessary for humanitarian reasons. Had you had a Russia, a hydro, hydrocarbon rich Russia with Putin in control in the 1990s, I'm not so sure at all our brave interventions would have taken place in the first place. Because they would have had to negotiate them through, they would have had to negotiate with Moscow in a totally different way than rather than just dictate to Moscow um, what they were going to do. But yes, I agree. Uh, the Russians saw the Kosovo, um, you know, uh, 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 Kosovo was a precedent um, that could lead to, you know, uh, uh, that could lead to breakaway republics, both inside the Soviet Union and, in, I mean, inside the old Soviet Union, uh, inside uh, and inside Russia itself. Um, I think if 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 Putin ever, you know, if Putin passes from the scene and Russia were to fall back into instability, which is what I would expect, I would not expect it to move forward into a stable democracy. Um, I think that suddenly you would have, you know, Dagestan, Chechnya, and other places would come under would come undone. And here's another cartographic uh, re redrawing that you should keep in mind: a weak Russia in the 21st century. And a stronger China, if that happens, will lead to Chinese migration and colonization throughout the Russian Far East um, uh, and in parts of Central Asia, where Russia would lose pieces of the map in decades to come. Yes, sir. Thank you, Pat Kutelia and McCain Institute. Excellent discussion. Thank you for this. Uh, and uh, uh, my question is, having in mind the developments in Iraq, uh, obviously the future solution or out, uh, outcome of the plans in Afghanistan might change its shape uh, with some relevance and the influence for NATO. So in this context, uh, uh, how would you characterize the importance of the Central Asia uh, in the region for the NATO, and what should be proactive policies of uh, NATO or the U.S. engagement in that region? Well, the, U the Afghanistan and Pakistan, for the first time in 13 years, are going to lose the stabilizing factor of the U.S. military, not totally, but to a significant extent over the next year or two. Um, that, I believe, is going to lead to a tremendous weakening of U.S. influence there. And I think that P Putin will be worried about Islamic extremism floating up north into Central Asia. And he's, not, and he's going to need intelligence on that. And he's not going to find it in Washington. He's going to find it in Pakistan. So whereas Pakistan and Russia have been more or less estranged for decades, I expect one of the new diplomatic formations to be a, a new, a new Pakistan-Russia alliance of sorts, and that Pakistan will play 
China and Russia off against each other in a small way, um, and uh, so that they need the U.S. much less and don't have to listen to a, a moral lectures from the West um, a, 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 as to what they need to do. I think that um, that. NATO was not able to really affect Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. had a very tough time. NATO is certainly not going to have much influence in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador? Yeah, I would make an additional point uh, about Central Asia. Of course, uh, one of the important aspects is that it will be and already is a, a playground to, between Russia and China. And it is interesting that now that the Russian establishment is disappointed about Europe and very much turning on China, and if you go around in Moscow and speak in various uh, semi-official think tanks, then everybody is speaking about China and about the wiseness of this other option of forming uh, some kind of a political, you know, understanding with China, the energy deal, etc., etc. I believe that in the end this will not be a successful alliance because both powers have clearly diverging interests. There's not much trust, neither historic nor contemporary, between the two great powers. Uh, there are a lot of friction points and Central Asia can easily be one of them. And there is also this understanding by the Chinese that Russians are now hooked, that they have given up, essentially, their way to balance themselves between China and Europe. They have given up this other side. And uh, this can only lead to problems. I, I would agree with that. I think for historical and geographical reasons, Russia and China can be tactical allies on this or that issue, but they cannot be strategic allies. And that my sense is that on the, the you know, the, 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 the announced pipeline deal where Russia will sell natural gas to China is that the Chinese got the better deal out of that. They really took the Russians to the cleaners on that. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I sense that, uh, that China has the demography. And also, China is a much more strongly institutionalized state than Russia is, with all of China's weakness. I know it's got a, you know, ec vast economic problems we could spend a whole day on. But it is still a more institutionalized, sturdy state than Russia is. Okay. Any questions? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Peter Magnilson from the Danish Embassy. This is a question for Yuri Luik. Um, from your vantage point in, in Moscow, how, how do we best influence uh, Russia in the coming years? You said, well, decisions are made very much by Putin himself. How do we influence it also in light of sort of the crisis that you lined up, which are likely to come? Again, there, there's no easy answer. But it's clear that in Moscow, firmness and clarity is appreciated. Our attachment to nuance is not appreciated. <laughs> and Russians are not surprised if we heavily protect our interests. In fact, they presuppose that we do that. They are not offended by it. They might look offended for tactical reasons, but they are not offended by it. So I think the answer is clarity in our interests, clarity in our values, and let's not always believe that somehow we can fudge the issues, the classical Western diplomatic ploy, that somehow the issue can be sort of uh, talked away. That is not clearly happening when one negotiates with Russia. And of course, uh, Russians always understand the practical moves, for instance, the sanctions. I mean, even if the sanctions were limited, they have had enormous psychological impact in Moscow because they have shown that when push comes to shove, the Western community is ready to act, is ready to fight 
And as was said here, the friction lines which we usually describe inside the European Union, inside NATO, et cetera, et cetera, are not so relevant anymore in this crisis situation. Uh, this has been a strong message. Yeah, I wanted, we just have a, a few more minutes left, but I wanted to ask a question of the ambassador. You know, part of um, the basic tenet that uh, Vladimir Putin has right now, that he is uh, uh, put forward during the Ukrainian crisis is that he has a responsibility to protect the Russian diaspora, the Russian speakers, and he would say basically anywhere. Um, he holds to this very strongly, and I think many people find it potentially very destabilizing. I mean, where does it end? Do you have a right to... Uh, you know, encourage people in Brighton Beach to rise up, you know, um, or and I'm being, I'm joking, but in a way it's not a joke because there are a number of Russians all over the world. Ambassador, do you think that this is, is this a policy? Is this a, a you know, a definite policy that he's going to follow? Um, how serious is he about it? Is this something he's just turning on to turn up the heat or could he follow through on it and, and where would you look for the first indication that he wants to do that? As I said in my introductory speech, I believe it is mainly to find a pretext to interfere into affairs of neighboring states. I mean, largely, I believe it is a ploy. I mean, we saw it with Crimea. There were zero risks for the Russian community in Crimea. I mean, zero. Even the Russian propaganda didn't try to prove this risk only afterwards, when people started to look for reasons why the whole operation was done, then kind of uh, some kind of flimsy uh, examples were provided. There were no examples at all, even no provocations which would have created a pretext. It was just done. So I don't feel that this is a real concern by Putin. Uh, I don't also feel that this is something which uh, he sees as the main driver of, uh, of his actions. And I, I think it is, um, it, is very important, uh, it is very important to keep in mind that there are a number of reasons which Putin has brought, as I said, in his Crimea adventure. But the key issue is, and when you read Putin's 17th of March speech, you see that this is a missionary speech. This is a guy with a mission. It is not practicalities anymore. It's not the details anymore. This is not important. There's a big mission. Uh, so one has to understand that a lot of the reasons what he brings, they are not necessarily, I mean, he, he doesn't care whether they are true or not. I mean, if a guy is in a mission, it's not important what he says. It's everything which is necessary for this mission. I mean, he said three times that he had withdrawn Russian troops from the Russian-Ukrainian border. And it was visibly wrong. And everybody knew that. And there were statements coming from the United States, from NATO, that the troops are still there. But, I mean, he just said it. Because, I mean, he, he just felt like this is something which should be tactically said in this particular circumstances. Uh, I always believe that people who believe that they have a mission uh, are, are, should be carefully sort of, <laughs> one, should, uh, one, one should acknowledge that there are risks involved. Uh, Robert, did you want to add anything? A man with a mission, to me, sounds very destabilizing. Um, yes, because he's not interested in practicalities. He's, what he motivates him is historical grievance. Um, and when you're motivated by historical grievance, um, you 
can become dangerous. Now, I would argue that the Chinese are also motivated in the East and South China Sea by historical grievance, that their humiliation by the Western powers, and even their internal civil war, which was a humiliating national experience in its own right. Remember, China almost fell apart in the 20th century in the 1930s. For, uh, for a civilization that went, goes back as a civilization to Roman times, and has been a great empire for most of that period to almost disappear from the map is a deeply humiliating experience. And so, but I would say that the, the Chinese form of resurrecting em, an empire of sorts is being done in much more elegant, sophisticated style than the Russian form of doing the same thing. Uh, with the Russian form, we see guys with black ski masks. Um, uh, you know, uh, occupying buildings and doing things. In China's case, they send an oil rig into waters claimed by Vietnam mm -hmm. and claimed all they're doing is finding out if there's oil there. They're not ready yet to decide whether they're going to exploit it. You know, it's, you know, it's, a, it's like the Chinese are very good at quarter steps and half steps and, and backtracking and all of that, so, whereas the Russians are more, more offensive in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, unfortunately, I think we're at the point where we have to end. But I want to thank you very much. It was a fascinating conversation, thank you. Ambassador Luik, and also Robert Kaplan. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the conference for, uh, for today. We have been uh, listening to presentations and discussions with great interest, and uh, I would like to thank all of you, those of you who presented and those of you who took the time to be here and give priority to issues that we are concerned with as we move towards the NATO summit uh, in September. We also marked the ending of a very successful project between the Atlantic Council the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies and the Norwegian Ministry of Defense. The project started 18 months ago, and through a series of conferences and seminars and workshops, we have raised issues concerning the future of NATO. And we have discussed challenges and opportunities, and I would like you to pay attention to the two reports that have come out of the Atlantic Council and the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. It's a one-hour read altogether. You can do it in less than a football match and uh, you will get some recommendations for the future. Let me take this opportunity to thank the Atlantic Council and the Brent Scarfcroft Center. I would especially like to acknowledge uh, Barry and Magnus and Simona and Robbie for their professionalism and enthusiasm. Thanks to Damon Wilson and his partner in crime, Ian Brzezinski, uh, for uh, having been part of this project all the way um, great discussions, great collaboration, thoughtful uh, assessments, and valuable inputs throughout the period, and good trips to Norway, and we also had fun. Uh, big thanks to the Institute for Defense Studies and its director, Sven Holtzmark, especially Michael Meyer, for all his efforts throughout the period. I'm thrilled that R uh, Professor Rolf Tumnes was with us today because he was part of initiating all this 18 months ago. Uh, closer to home, thank you to Christina Fjellstad. She's been the one putting discipline into all of these guys. Otherwise, it would have been intellectual anarchy of the first order. Bob Dylan once said that the future is so bright, I need shades. I, I don't know if we're quite there with NATO, but, uh, but we have to think about these issues and take them seriously. And I would like to thank the Atlantic Council for continuously thinking of the transatlantic link and the relationship uh, between the United States and Europe. So thank you all for uh, 
for, uh, for today, this, uh, this conference. It's been very interesting. Thank you, Barry, and I'll give you the final word, at least for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, John. And uh, you don't have to tweet this part. Um, but thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I also just wanted to offer my very brief thank you, brief but uh, very heartfelt and sincere thanks to our Norwegian MOD colleagues, all of you. Uh, you're, I won't name every, everyone, but um, you all know who you are, but the, the core team, we've really enjoyed working from you and we've learned a lot. Um, I also wanted to uh, ask the audience to join me in uh, giving a round of applause to Simona Kordosova, Robbie Grammer, uh, Michael Meyer and his team, th these guys worked together the entire time, uh, 18 months of sustained effort to really advance the ball on these issues. So please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> uh, and today, thanks to the events team, uh, Ian and um, uh, Megan and uh, Catherine uh, on, on our, our team as well. Thank you for uh, this excellent Excellent conference. I learned a lot, and I'm going to go back over the, the video on some of these because it really was rich. And uh, please, everyone in this room, keep the conversation going. Um, we'll be having other events on Twitter with the same hashtag, uh, doing a lot of work between now and the Whale Summit in early September. And then we'll certainly be doing more work pushing through the summit as well. Uh, it's a uh, very important set of issues. The Alliance is a very valuable mechanism for a world that uh, as depressing as Bob Kaplan made it seem, uh, we still have to deal with it. We have to live in it. Uh, we'll face security challenges. We'll face opportunities. And I think the best way to uh, deal with them and to sec secure our prosperity as well as our safety is to continue to have these discussions and help, help improve the alliance mechanism. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming.